Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Second seminar on cybersecurity and defense, cyber defense challenges in the Brazilian space projection. The opinions expressed by Brazilian Air Force University and Getulio Vargas Foundation personnel and the guests who took part in the event and the online broadcast represent exclusively the author's points of view and not necessarily the institutional position of the GVF. We would like to emphasize that all the people present here agreed to take part in this event spontaneously. Therefore, they authorize the use of their images for this broadcast, which will be available later on the GVF official channel. We would like to remember to the audience of subscribing to the YouTube channel and activate the bell to receive the notifications. We would like to communicate to the audience that the questions should be sent to the link Slido in the description below. A video of Professor Bielor Celza Cavalcanti from Getulio Vargas Foundation will be shown now. Good morning. It is with great honor that I represent Getulio Vargas Foundation in its role as a think tank committed to national development in the realization together with the Air Force University and with the presence of such outstanding participants of the second seminar on security and cyber defense. For centuries, interaction between nations has produced important developments both through tensions and conflicts as well as through bilateral and multilateral efforts carried out in agreements under the most recent aegis of international law. Even today, in spite of centuries-old developments on land, sea and air, there is still much to do. Nevertheless, the civilizing dynamic does not stop. And in nowadays, the special dimension is already presented as an unavoidable challenge, both in the opportunities and in its threats. It should be noted that Brazil has on its national flag the positivist motto Ordem e Progresso, Order and Progress, in which a firm commitment to peace is learned, as well as a spherical special image in which the Cruzeiro do Sul, the Southern Cross, shines. The constant systemic tensions between disintegrating and tropic forces, on the one hand, and the homeostatic balance promoted by nations committed to order and progress, as Brazil is, on the other hand, are now presenting themselves in the space sphere, which demands not only new technologies in the cyberspace, but also political social engineering supported by the appropriate legal frameworks and capabilities to effectively enforce them. We hope that this seminar will contribute to the Brazilian and international efforts in this area of enormous strategic relevance. Have a productive time. The Brazilian Air Force University holds the webinar whose main topic is the new international law in face of cybersecurity challenges in outer space. Some words from Major General Pedro Arthur Linares Lima from Brazilian Air Force University and then shall pass the floor to the mediator, Lieutenant General Adir da Silva, President of Space and Aviation Law Brazilian Society. Good morning, everybody. Once again, I welcome you aboard the second seminar on cybersecurity and defense on behalf of the Dean of the Brazilian Air Force University, Brigadier General Renato and the Getulio Vargas Foundation. 
This year, the theme is Challenge of Cyber Defense in the Brazilian Space Projection. As a reminder, our main objective here is to present and discuss how cybersecurity and defense in the space sector are being sought about, planned, and put into practice by the Brazilian Air Force, national and international organization, and companies operating in this strategic sector for the Brazilian society. As planned, today we will have the second stage of our flight plan with the following team the new international law in face of cybersecurity challenges in outer space. And our pilot, whom we invited to conduct today's mediation, will be the Lieutenant General Adir da Silva, current president of the Brazilian Association of Aeronautical and Space Law. Mr. Adir is Master in Logistics and System at Air Force Institute of Technology in the United States. He has his PhD in Law and Economics at Université Paul Cézanne, France. He has, sorry, he was the Director General of the Aerospace Technical Center, President of Telebrais, Embertel Council, and President of Infraero. Mr. Adir, the aircraft is at your command. Fasten your city belts and enjoy our flight. A good event for everyone and hope to see you in the next talk. Thank you. Well, General and my, my friends, speakers, it's a great pleasure to be with you. And, and I, I, my hopes are to have some group of information and to, to learn about this, this very important sub subject. And to start with my some short presentation, I would like to make my reference to the first, uh, I, I, could, I, I could say, a cyber attack uh, we have notes in history. This happens during the Cold War. And I, what, I would like to show you what happened with the, uh, in 1982, at when, what, what <laughs> When we, we started this uh, movement, we, which had developed the, uh, very quickly in the last uh, uh, the, the decades. And so we are moving very, 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 very rapidly in, the, in this uh, 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 field of knowledge and the high technology. Uh, I, I, that's, that's time to, to make the presentation here. No, 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 and so I'm very happy to be with you, and I, I, I have the hopes that you have a very good time during this meeting. Okay. Uh, and so to start with, I, I would like to have the, the words of uh, Mrs. Dr. Victoria Sampson. Hello. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, could I please have my presentation on the screen? Uh, while it's up there, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. And I'll be talking about cyber as a counter space capability. The Secure World Foundation is a private operating foundation that promotes cooperative solutions for space sustainability. Our vision is the secure, sustainable, and peaceful use of outer space that contributes to global stability on Earth. Our mission is that we work with governments, industry, international organizations, and civil society to develop and promote ideas and behaviors for international collaboration that achieve the secure, sustainable, and peaceful uses of outer space. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
Um, so I'll be talking about why cybersecurity is part and importance of space stability. The space domain is undergoing a significant amount of changes. A growing number of countries and commercial actors are getting involved in space, resulting in more innovation and benefits on Earth, but also more congestion and competition from a security perspective. An increasing number of countries are looking to use space to enhance their military capabilities and national security. The growing use of and reliance on space for national security has also led to more countries to look into developing their own counter space capabilities that can be used to interrupt or interfere with space systems. The existence of counter space capabilities is not new, but the circumstances surrounding them are. There are also greater potential consequences from their widespread use. It could have global repercussions well beyond the military, as huge parts of the global economy and society are increasingly reliant on space applications. The disruption or even perception of concerns of disruption of space capabilities can be extremely destabilizing. The situation is further complicated by increasing dependence of commercial and civil space systems supporting the global economy and the challenge of determining the exact cause of a satellite mal malfunction whether it was due to a space weather event, impact by space debris, unintentional interference, or deliberate aggression. Satellites and other space assets, just like other parts of the digitalized critical infrastructure, are vulnerable to cyber attack. Cyber vulnerabilities in space therefore pose serious risk for ground-based critical interference, and insecurities in the space environment will hinder economic development and increase the risk to society. Resilience is key for the continuity of national security missions, and that means cybersecurity has a role to play. Next slide, please. So cyber is seen as a usable counter space option um, because kinetic attacks are considered to be less likely, largely because there's plausible deniability in terms of using a cyber attack, whereas if you launch a missile at a satellite, it's pretty obvious where it comes from. Generally speaking, um, this is destabilizing because the laws of armed conflict through space are unclear. Um, while this is encouraging um, that, there, that generally speaking, we're not seeing large amounts of debris being deliberately created in orbit, it's a little unsettling as the law of armed conflict is not um, agreed upon. I won't go into too much depth because I know there'll be speakers talking about it later, but I would like to say proportionality, what constitutes an armed attack, distinction between civil and military users, that's all unclear. There are a couple of different efforts attempting to establish how international humanitarian law and laws of armed conflict apply to space, um, but they are still being worked on. They're not complete. They may be done by next year, but even if they are done, it will take a while to proliferate and become the accepted norm of responsible space actors. In the meantime, we risk having the technology get out ahead of the policies and laws that are regulating it. Next slide, please. So an assessment of um, space as a counter, um, cyber as a counter space capability. Uh, this, my presentation is largely taken from an assessment the migration does, an unclassified assessment of global counter space capabilities around the world. Um, it's available on my organization's website. I have the URL here, um, but I'll be talking specifically about the cyber assessment. Multiple countries likely possess cyber capabilities that could be used against space systems. However, actual evidence of cyber attacks in the public domain are limited. The United States, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran have all demonstrated the ability and willingness to engage in the offensive cyber attacks against non-space targets. Additionally, a growing number of non-space actors are actively probing commercial systems and discovering cyber vulnerabilities that are similar in nature to those in non-space systems. But to date, there have only been a few publicly disclosed cyber attacks directly targeting space systems. And I believe my next, the next speaker will go into more detail about that. Cyber attacks against space capabilities are similar to cyber attacks against non-space systems. They often, avoid, they often involve attempts to provide um, user-provided information to a system that causes software to perform in unexpected ways. Um, common cyber attacks exploit the lack of or faulty authentication of users and commands. 
the more software features and components a system has and the more types of channels of data that it processes, the higher the attack surface of potential vulnerabilities. There's also an unclear distinction between cyber attacks and electronic warfare. Oftentimes they blend. In any case, integrating and complementary use of an array of anti-satellite capabilities, particularly again, a blending of electronic warfare and cyber attack is likely to occur. Representing a growing sophistication in tools and techniques, the denial degrade of systems. Generally speaking, looking at the state of cybersecurity for satellite infrastructure, it is quote, dismal. This provides both state and non-state actors with a backdoor into a wide array of space and ground-based critical infrastructures. Next slide, please. So looking at the exact nature and cyber extent cyber capabilities with any precision based on open source information is difficult. There have been only a few cases of publicly acknowledged cyber attacks against satellites, and even the information on those is incomplete. Still, some general conclusions may be drawn about the capabilities and existence based on a technical assessment of vulnerabilities and a review of known instances of use. So there are several categories of cyber attacks that we've seen on space systems. First, the risks to the global supply chain security posed by the increasing use of faulty um, electronics and materials produced abroad have been well documented. Deliberate installation of hidden backdoors in software or hardware products is another primary threat vector. And we've seen this done by um, China, Russia, and the United States. The second category of cyber attacks are those directed against links between satellites and ground control stations. Most of these are likely to be man in the middle attacks, a term that involves an attacker inserting themselves between the sender and the receiver. It is also possible, but very often difficult to use a cyber attack against the command and control or C2 link to gain access to the satellite bus or payloads. This type of attack is made easier if the C2 system is unencrypted or does not properly authenticate demands, commands. The third category involves attacks on terrestrial C2 or data relay stations. Although many satellite C2 facilities are hardened against cyber attacks and take precautions such as air gapping critical networks, there are examples of sophisticated state attackers being able to penetrate systems. A fourth category involves cyber attacks against the user segment of a space system, often the terminals or devices used to, used to receive or process a satellite signal. In many cases, these attacks are very similar to cyber attacks against other types of computer equipment and focus on exploiting hardware or software vulnerabilities in devices. I'd just like to point out that even modern platforms with a high degree of security engineered in are vulnerable to attacks to the degree in which they rely upon and interact with highly vulnerable legacy and civilian systems. Next slide, please. So cyber, talking about the potential military utility of cyber um, capabilities for counter space. Cyber weapons often offer a tremendous utility as both a situation replacement for and complement to conventional counter space capabilities. Of course, like anything, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is that these cyber and electronic warfare capabilities can produce a range of effects. This allows the type and degree of counter space operation to be narrowly tailored to the desired objective, in contrast to the comparatively blunt and single knot instrument that a kinetic anti satellite weapon represents. The second advantage to, for cyber attacks in the counter space role is access. Some type of cyber attacks require little or no direct access or can be created by gaining access far in advance. The third advantage is the difficulty of attribution, attributing cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are often substantially more difficult to trace and competently attribute than conventional counter space weapons, particularly kinetic weapons. This can be valuable, but I'd like to point out it also carries some risk of unintended escalation the military value of being able to carry out weapons, either undetected or in a deniable fashion, is clear. However, many note the danger of quick escalation 
that such can attend such deliberately opaque approaches as a difficulty in guaranteeing a reliable and proportional response can create incentives for each side to move first in case of an impending crisis. Fourth, a rudimentary cyber capability can be faster, easier, and less expensive to procure than a kinetic alternative. The barrier to entry for basic capabilities can be exceptionally low. In contrast, conventional counterspace operations require expensive, time-consuming, and highly visible development of extensive space program including a plan for space situational awareness and space tracking, telemetry, and command operations, as well as the counter space capability itself and supporting infrastructure. Thus, cyber capabilities provide newcomers with an especially asymmetric means of access denial or cost infliction when confronting established space powers. The inherent challenges of being able to attribute cyber capability often make it difficult to use the existence or use of offensive cyber counter space for deterrence, signaling, signaling intent, or preventing escalation. And it can also be difficult for a cyber attacker to know if their cyber attack will succeed, particularly in a military useful timeframe, and, and if it will have the desired effect. It is always possible that the target has detected the preparations or patched the vulnerability and may even be able to deceive the attacker into thinking the attack worked, thus potentially undermining the broader military campaign it supported. And I know I'm getting close on time. Um, I have one more slide, please. Next slide. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about US national space policy in regards to the cybersecurity of space capabilities. Um, the United States released Space Policy Directive 5 um, cybersecurity principles through space systems literally last month. So um, it's still very early in terms of how this document will be carried out, but it does provide a whole government framework intended to safeguard space assets. Um, it is um, the cyber, the SPD5 talks about the need to protect space systems from cyber incidents in order to prevent the disruptions to their ability to provide reliable and efficient contributions to the operations of critical infrastructure. It's meant to be the continuity of several strategies. First of all, there's a national security strategy of December 2017, which states that the United States must maintain our leadership and freedom of action in space and talks about the need um, for developers, manufacturers, owners and operators of space systems to design, build and operate and manage them so they're resilient to cyber incidents and radio frequency spectrum interference. The national cyber strategy um, of 2018 talks about uh, the need to enhance efforts to protect US space assets and supporting infrastructure from evolving cyber attacks and working with industry and national partners to um, strengthen cyber resilience of existing and future space systems. So the, the SPD-5 talks about how space has special circumstances, specifically talking about the need to perform updates and respond to incidents remotely. So they, it really it asks for these to be integrated in the design of the space vehicle before launch such as because most space vehicles in orbit cannot be physically accessed. So the emphasis in SPD-5 really is integrating cybersecurity in all phases of development and ensuring a full life cycle cybersecurity to be critical for space systems. Um, section four lists all the principles. The one that I think is probably most indicative of the attitude for the SPD-5 talks about um, the need to um, have implementation of these principles through rules, regulations, and guidance. So the idea is that they're setting up norms of behavior for responsible cybersecurity of space capabilities. It's not really regulating, it's just more a recommendation of these guidelines. Uh, I would say it's a very soft regulatory touch at all. Um, so, but uh, as I said as well, it's very new in its um, release and it's hard to say how it will be implemented particularly since the United States has been focused on other things like we have election coming up this year. But we'll see how that pans out and I look forward to answering any questions. Next slide, please. So you have my contact information and my Twitter account. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate being here and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Samson.
It just is a brilliant speech you provide us. And because you suscitated many questions regarding space, starting with the problems of the traffic control of space, if you could call in this way. Uh, besides this, you bring us very advanced information about the application of a technology in space. And most of all, it's, I believe it's more, more important, you gave us the idea of how the US is dealing with, with the regulation in space, uh, the, the defense, the cyber defense and the cyber uh, protection, which is very important for all. Considering that uh, you, you uh, offered uh, to answer questions, uh, we have uh, two questions uh, to uh, offer you. The first question, if you, if you allow me, is uh, why is cyber perceived to be such a usable counter space weapon as compared to other kinds? Could you answer this question? Sure. Um, cyber is seen as being much more usable, largely because you have plausible deniability. Um, if there's a cyber attack, it's not like in the movies where you can immediately trace the next day who did it. It's nothing like that. You know, it can take months, if not years, to figure out even if a cyber attack had occurred and then to trace back who did it. And then even if you can trace back physically where the attack um, began from, Obviously, you don't know necessarily if the government was behind it or if it was some sort of non-state actor. So if you're trying to not necessarily escalate things in a tremendous way, but just interfere with another um, operator's use of their satellites, cyber can be seen as an option that doesn't necessarily commit you to any you know, active conflict or kinetic options or things like that. As well, cyber is seen as attractive because, I mean, the main thing for space capabilities is the information that they bring to the users. And so any interference with the, that information is considered to be helpful, I guess, in a hostile circumstance. However, users of space don't want space to be littered with debris from a kinetic attack any more than anyone else does. And so cyber allows one, in theory, depending how you use it, of course, to sidestep the deliberate creation of debris, but yet still interfere with other countries' use of their space assets. So that's why it's seen as potentially useful capability as opposed to the quote, nuclear option of doing a kinetic anti-satellite intercept. Uh, thank, thank you for a kind answer. And uh, I would like to present you a second question, which is, what is the U.S. government's policy of protecting the cybersecurity on its space assets? Um, well, I went over the SPD-5, the Space Policy Directive 5, which is a relatively recent addition. Um, there are a whole series of cybersecurity infrastructure. In fact, October is a cybersecurity safety month. Um, where there's a whole bunch of series where they're trying to encourage users to get more um, cyber safe, um, have better quote cyber hygiene, things of that nature. I think it's just becoming, there's becoming more of a recognition in general by all space users and creators that cyber security needs to be built in from the very beginning. Um, and this is part of a shift in thinking. Um, it used to be that, you know, satellite users and developers they put cyber in at the very end if they thought about it at all. Um, it was seen as a burden. It's something that really most space users didn't have to work with. So the US government is trying to encourage, I think, based on this recent SPD-5 and statements you hear from Space Force officials and just military officials in general about the need to incorporate cybersecurity from the very beginning. They're trying to prioritize the cybersecurity of space assets, again, from all points of the supply chain, from all points of the users, um, and then from all points of the owners and operators. So it's a shift. It's going to take a while to come into fruition, but I think we're definitely seeing a, a higher priority placed on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Victoria Sampson, for, sure, for your very kind presentation and answer to our questions. 
And so we are very gratified by information and the level of knowledge that you gave to us. Thank you very much. Uh, and have a, a, a very nice way back. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to uh, have with us uh, Dr. Ana Cristina, who was presented in the, in the beginning and kindly uh, came to give us some information regarding this very sensible subject. With us, uh, Professor Ana Cristina, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure uh, to be uh, in this uh, seminar. It's a honor for me to receive this invitation and to share the panel with so dis distinguished uh, colleagues. So, uh, my name is Ana Cristina Galego Rosa. I'm a legal advisor and an entrepreneur. And uh, also, uh, I am a mentor of the UNOSA Space for Women program. So, uh, cybersecurity in outer space, the next frontier for space activities, is the topic of my presentation. And it is going to cover the general overview of cybersecurity, a possible solution for cybersecurity in space mission, it is regulation, especially in the European Union. Yes, uh, for, for the beginning, I would like to point why we need a cybersecurity in outer space. Space 4.0 uh, represents the evolution of the space sector into a new area. It's analogous uh, to the in, uh, Industry 4.0, called the fourth industrial revolution of manufacturing and services. More recently, the company, uh, and, and the more recent, recently, the company SpaceX uh, uh, will be able to launch um, in the next years uh, uh, 405,000 satellites on orbit. So that means there'll be a, a, a huge increase of uh, activities in outer space. So there is an increased number of diver diverse space actors nowadays, including the emergence of private companies. As I mentioned, now the SpaceX uh, uh, will be launched in the next years, uh, five, five, uh, for, um, 45,000 satellites. And due to this increased number of space actors, uh, there are vulnerabilities in, in space em emissions caused by threats in their systems. And this can occur, for example, because these systems are old. But the most serious is that due to the due use of satellite as civil or military, any threats, especially in the military field, can result in serious consequence. That is why this is one of the reasons for a cybersecurity in outer space activities. So, and to con uh, However, uh, to understand a little more about the uh, scope of the abrogence of cybersecurity, I bring its definition addressed at the International Telecommunication Union recommendation that described the cybersecurity in the collection as a collection of two policies, security concepts, security safeguards, guidelines, uh, risk management approaches, actions, training, best practices, assurance technologies, then can be used to protect the cyber environment. But when we talk about cybersecurity in outer space, we must include their services in the ground segment, which is also part of a space mission. So what are the, what are the attacks or 
uh, hacks that can target a satellite. So the first one is the eavesdropping. This happen when someone is listening the communication. The source here could be uh, the base stations where the destination could be a satellite in orbit. The second one is called jamming. This happened when multiple attacks target a, a victim on the same time. In this case, the victim will be bombarded with several requests and it is not going to be able to serve the legitimate one. The third case is called hijack, where someone can steal uh, a session in the communication and uh, he can redirect it to a fake satellite and the control, which is controlled by a, a hacker. In addition of these the three categories, there are a lot of attacks in the industrial systems of satellites. In this slide, I just would like to highlight some of the threats that are intentional and unintentional against satellites. The first figure in my left, we see the attacks that are unintentional. And the second in my right, the, the figure uh, is intentional. The threats are distributed in three parts. We need to understand about this. Ground base, the attack can be in the ground base and the space base and can be also through the interference. Example of the threats in the ground base could be uh, the natural disasters. When a natural disasters that are uh, unintentional could be an intentional against a, a base station. That means when when happen some uh, uh, natural disasters and and uh, uh, can destroy a, 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 a base station. Well, I would like also uh, to mention some uh, incidents uh, occurred. As an example, here in, in my list in 2009, a five years old computer hacker caused a 21 days shutdown of NASA computers that support the International Space Stations. So this is, was a, a serious, serious problem. Here, I would like all, I have the list only the incidents that occur in NASA. So, uh, and the, the most recently uh, was uh, in 2019, as listed in, in the figure in my uh, left side. So, what is the uh, possible solutions for this um, uh, uh, threats. No? The quantum application uh, appeared uh, uh, some time ago and the biggest experience and the most important was the Chinese satellite launched in 2016. The proposed mission is basically investigate the space-based quantum communication for creation of a hack-proof communication network. The quantum of theory says that uh, atomic particle can act in two place at once. So why, what, uh, for, what is the benefit for this uh, technology, the quantum technology in space? The quantum, uh, the quantum application in space can be used in cryptography for more secure data encryptions. So quantum method is to generate communications keys encrypted with uh, an assembly of entanglable photons. The information that will be transmitted will be encoded by a set of random numbers generated between the transmitter and the receiver. So 
um, that technology has been uh, being used uh, by the Ch Chinese and other nations nowadays. So uh, one and one of the example uh, since 2016, the Chinese now uh, they the mission satellites successful establish an ultra security leaking, leaking link between two ground stations separated by more than 1,000 kilometers. This is, was a huge step well, already established by the Chinese. Could be an uh, 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 impact on, on the international policy. So, and uh, I would like to just give uh, an overview about this, the space cybersecurity cyber framework. So there is no international uh, framework on space cyber security, specifically on space cyber security. But uh, there is, the, uh, the, but applicable uh, national legislations and policies uh, can deal with uh, the cyber security. Example, uh, as uh, my uh, a colleague, uh, uh, the early speaker, uh, Dr. Victoria May, was described the U.S. Space Policy uh, Five, yeah. one of a recent example that is now uh, um, uh, states they are developed now policy in this field. So. How is the space cybersecurity established in Europe? There is no EU legislation or policy for cybersecurity in space systems. Yeah. Uh, European, the European Network and Information Security Agency, uh, ENISA, uh, there is not yet any provisions for uh, cybersecurity in space systems. So, what the, the 2014 the EU cyber defense policy framework uh, established uh, cyber threats framework and policy but very general in 2017 the cyber diplomatic uh, uh, toolbox uh, establishes established uh, sanction, sanctions against the individuals responsible for cyber attacks and uh, in 2018, the EU space program uh, regulation also uh, established protection of space infrastructure against cyber attacks. So about in, what is uh, the, the, the situation, the overview in some countries in, in Europe uh, in this regard in this, uh, about space security. So France, Oh, in 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 its uh, cyber policy, consider satellites as part of cyberspace. In 2019, also uh, the France, the the space defense strategy recognized the cyber threat on satellites. So in the UK, uh, in 2020. Uh, the cybersecurity toolkit uh, for companies uh, establish types of uh, threat, attackers, incidents, reporting, and cybersecurity standards to apply. In Italy, uh, in 2019, uh, was established establish, uh, the strategy for space, uh, recognize the, 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 in 2010, 2019 recognized the, the cyber uh, threats on space and ground segments. So we can see here that there is only uh, policies, uh, some policies that de develop in, in European countries, but still not in details. So thank you. Uh Pro Professor Ana Cristina, it was a great pleasure uh, listening to your words. You advised us in very important points, and we are very happy to listen 
to this, uh, your discussion about set many technologies of, of, of protection of in cyber, cyberspace. Uh, we are ve very happy to know that uh, you can explain you about uh, the, the, all, all the weakness of the legislation and the movements that uh, Europe is doing in order to correct this gap. And so uh, I would like to know, see if, if you could answer kindly uh, two questions we received. Well, the first question is, uh, may, may you read the question? May? Yes, thank you. What, what could be the impact of quantum technology on international policy? No, no audio, you, we are without yes, audio. Yes, 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 thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, the the audience was uh, pick up my my point when I uh, mentioned yes, that. Yeah. No, hello, it's audio. This uh, uh, mentioned that I I have uh, mentioned that the quantum technology could be uh, get uh, impact on international policy. So uh, everybody is listening me, you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. So uh, in my point of view, the quantum uh, communication, uh, this technology uh, in military in defense uh, will enable China to be a strong leader in military uh, sophistication and which, which will empower, empower uh, it's geopolitical influence. That's it. Uh, that could be now a, a race, uh, a new race for the power of quantum. So this technology. So this is my the scenario that I I can uh, see right now. Thank you for for uh, your, your answer. And. Uh, which you raised in our mind, uh, what would be the, the ways to spread in the technology and the courses of this new technology? But it's uh, some, something else. Yeah. Now, let, let, let us ask you the second question. Um, how European international organizations in, in the space sector are dealing with the uh, Cybersecurity issues. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I can thank you for the question again. I, I can give an example uh, regarding the European Space Agency, ESA, uh, in this moment. In it is, uh, I think, is the Director General, the Director General propose. Uh, recognize uh, to establish a, strat a strategy concern uh, ESA space security activities in coordination with its member states and other uh, national and European actors. So um, at, this, uh, at this moment, the European Space Agency recognizes that the space security is um, ISU uh, in regarding the cyber security uh, problems. Uh, Professor Anna Cristina, thank you very much for your intervention, your answers. And uh, if, if, if someone needs more questions, I would like to uh, suggest okay. to send it by email. And we are ready to, to, to uh, transfer to Professor to give the proper answer. Thank you. Uh, and yes. I'm I, very happy. If you, if you allow to be... by... Hello? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Doctor, if you allowed me, I just would like to to give an advice. If uh, some of the um, students or academics wants to to follow uh, a PhD, a doctor in the in the quant application, they are be uh, more than happy to contact me, so I can give you more uh, 
uh, guidelines how uh, the programs were uh, to apply. Thank you. That, that's right. And you are very happy, especially because you, you are a very active member of the group of space of the Brazilian aerospace uh, and uh, law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Well, follow, uh, following our, our program, I have the pleasure to invite uh, prof Professor, Dr. Professor uh, Marquise to provide us uh, some, your, your speech and uh, our cons your considerations on this very important uh, matter related to space. Professor Marquise, the word is to you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Moderator Major Da Silva. I'm very, very happy to be here today with you and all the other panelists, and I thank you very much for this invitation. I want, as I said, I have no presentation, PowerPoint, but I wanted to share this, the first slide that I prepared for this uh, uh, meeting, and then I had no time to complete it, but the first one, I can share just to, uh, okay, to uh, let you know what I will be with. Uh, so, uh, thinking about the topic of this meeting, I remember the two occasions when I had the opportunity to discuss these issues. Uh, recently, of course, not a long time ago. The first one was the webinar of the American Society of on February 27, 2020, which was named the Discerning the Rules, the application of international law to state cyber attacks. And there was a big discussion about the existence or non-existence of obligations of states concerning the cyber attacks prohibition. Uh, but uh, as you see, I, I, have, I am the supporter of the opinion that uh, if the cyber attacks reaches a certain uh, threshold and causes serious damages, it should be qualified uh, as an armed attack as uh, according to international law. The second uh, opportunity I had to discuss this issue was participation on the group of governmental experts of the United Nations on further practical measures for the prevention of an arms race in outer space that I was told uh, to as a representative, the expert representative of the Italian government there, uh, with other 25 uh, experts, uh, excuse me, and uh, with uh, also an expert, a uh, very no, well-known expert from uh, Brazilian uh, diplomacy, uh, which was the former president of the Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space in Vienna. A great leader, so I have had the opportunity to discuss within this group the problem of the, uh, well, uh, principles applying to such kind of behaviors. Uh, we discussed uh, this uh, within the whole group and within the so-called like-minded experts. Is to call the members of the group that they were, uh, I, I would say very sincerely, uh, Western countries, European countries, and uh, uh, other countries which uh, were of the same opinion of us in the sense that the problem is not to prevent an arms race in outer space, is not to, to prohibit the placement of weapons, but to have prohibition about irresponsible behavior in space. Because, uh, you know, even if you place, even if you prohibit the placement of weapons in outer space, uh, that is to say, of devices. Uh, which are uh, crafted for destroying other space, uh, space objects, you can also have recourse to normal, innocuous satellites to destroy other satellites. It is a matter of intent. It's very important. 
So there was an opposition in this group, Paros, you know, the chief Paros, uh, between uh, the uh, tenants of the opinion of the politician of placement and on the other side, the tenants of the opinion of the uh, prohibition of behavior. We reached the uh, useful conclusions, but the report was not uh, adopted in the end of April 2019 because uh, there was no consensus. And this kind of, of DGE works according to the consensus. But my main point is to go to uh, the issue. Professor, Professor, yeah. Professor Marquez, excuse me. It's just a, a little fancy, you, you, your voice. It, Ah, so you cannot hear me well? You, you are missing the, 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 the strength. Okay, I, I don't know. I will try. No, Can you no, hear no, me no, it's better? Okay. It's okay now? No, no, Thank it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for <laughs> advising me of that. So I will go to the key point, uh, in my opinion, and this is the, uh, for the legal aspects, the key. Uh, point of the applicable law of cyber attacks in outer space. Uh, you know, uh, from the legal point of view, we can deal with cyber crimes and cyber attacks. When we uh, deal with cyber crimes, we are dealing with something that uh, uh, falls within the scope of national law because we are dealing with individual behavior this is a problem of domestic law. We have a treaty in Europe, which is the Budapest Convention of 2001 on cybercrime. It was negotiated within the framework of the Council of Europe, and it requires all state parties, including Italy, of course, my own country, to introduce certain cyber crimes into their national criminal legislation, to extend their jurisdiction over crimes committed from their territory or by their nationals. Uh, so the point that should be underlined that when you speak of cyber crimes, you are dealing with computer-related offenses committed by individuals, not states, uh, such as uh, fraud offenses related to child pornography, offenses related to infringement of copyrights and related rights, and so on. But here we are, if I'm not wrong, dealing with state-led cyber operations which fall within the scope of international law. I will limit uh, uh, myself to some uh, uh, key elements without entering into detail because the time is too short. But I think that the main point is uh, international space law has the same rule as international law at large. Uh, this is clearly expressed in Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty where well, it is said that uh, state parties shall carry out on activities in exploration and use of outer space in accordance with international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. So all the prohibitions contained in the Charter of the United Nations apply to outer space. There is no, no problem on that. But there is a divergence of opinion, no? Because uh, uh, when we, were in the Paros GG, uh, there were states, experts considering that, uh, uh, considering that it was necessary to restate this prohibition of the use of a force uh, in a special, uh, while others, and I was among these people, considered that uh, the uh, prohibition of the use of force, Article 240, is fully applicable in outer space. There's no problem on that. We should apply this prohibition. And I produce also the evidence, uh, the translation of the famous Russian International Law Manual uh, of professors uh, Gennady Zukov and Kolosov. Both of them had very well developed so uh, again, the issue of having a prohibition of armed force, uh, as it, uh, this was not already provided for by international law, is a wrong opinion, in my mind. 
uh, of course, uh, armed attack is a very strong uh, qualification. Qualification. So, uh, out of every, but in space, every object can be used as a weapon, as I said. Even an innocuous satellite can be used uh, as a weapon to destroy another satellite, provoking an intentional collision, for instance. And in case of cyber attacks, there could be very uh, serious consequences on Earth, and sometimes also there can be, uh, of course, serious material damage on Earth that a cyber attack can inflict. Of course, there are various degrees, we discussed this in GGE, but referring to jamming, to laser blinding, to GS generating, to SSD generating, to space robot attacks, to deployment the use of, of nuclear weapons, which is, by, uh, is prohibited already, uh, and even the deployment of bunker bombs, buster bombs in, in outer space. Well, we, uh, we uh, uh, take into consideration the fact that the effect on systems can be reversible or irreversible, can be uh, long damaging and not damaging. So we should take into consideration, in my opinion, that the answer to the question, is a cyber attack, an armed attack under international law, can be affirmative. New certain circumstances can be uh, and I rely on some documents that exist, for instance, uh, the uh, UK uh, document uh, on uh, uh, such kind of topic published in 2016. Uh, it points out that a sustained attack against the UK banking system, which would cause several severe financial damage to the state leading to a worsening economic security situation for the population is an example of a cyber operation that can constitute a use of force. In conclusion, only cyber attacks that significantly alter the functioning of the critical infrastructures in order to adversely affect the state security and the provision of essential services potentially fall within the scope of the prohibition referred to in Article 2, Paragraph 9. In other cases, of minor damages and interferences. We should uh, also remind that Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, well, there is no a specific prohibition on armed interference, but there is all uh, the second part of the vision that deals with consultation about armed interferences. So it means that the concept of armed interferences is inside the ratio of the Outer Space Treaty and Space Law, and it is acquiring more and more importance in this field, because, as I said, not all the uh, experiences, damages that cyber attacks can cause reach the threshold of uh, a severe inclusion uh, within the field. Sovereignty of Africa. So I would only remember what was said in 63 when negotiating the Outer Space Treaty by the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space uh, the importance of the problem of preventing potentially harmful interference with peaceful use of outer space. It is not a, 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 is not something unknown that I always uh, be a strong supporter of uh, uh, so-called forms of security. It is not necessary to go necessarily as a first step to a legally binding treaty. We can also uh, uh, use other kind of uh, international instruments. Uh, we have uh, just now, Italy was the eighth uh, Subscribe to the Artemis Accords, which is a set of principles not binding and which, in my mind, are very, very important to back this, the activities that will be carried out on, uh, uh, on the moon within the 
project of uh, Artemis, the Artemis project of NASA. Pro uh, professor, we are yeah. missing, excuse me, Professor Marquise, we, we are missing a, 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 your sound, your, your, your voice, please. Could you try to, to improve it? Uh, I. Okay, good. I try without <laughs> earphones. Huh? I try without earphones. It is better now or not? No. I don't see any, any reaction to my. I'm very sorry because normally I use this. Uh, uh, see for uh, such kind of, of uh, conversations without problem. I don't know why I have these problems today, but this is a very, very common. Huh? Uh, so, can I go ahead now? You have sufficient, uh, uh, yes? Oh, I see my friend Victoria saying yes. So, <laughs> I will, yes, I will continue. And uh, so, uh, this is, uh, I think, the main point, that we should try to have some kind of commitments at the international level, uh, mainly to fill the gaps, because once we have said that international law and space law apply to such kind of cyber attacks, of course, we do not have solved all the problems, because there are many details, as was said by Professor Anna Cristina earlier uh, uh, to decide upon, to regulate. It's not all done. Uh, so we should, of course, uh, uh, try to, to uh, have a, a moment for uh, uh, discuss the possibility of having some something about cyber attacks and the malicious uses of cyber. Uh, the, the, what was uh, realized within the United Nations until now doesn't cover the uh, outer space because of the uh, GGEs that were created since 2004 and are still now in, in, uh, working, carrying on their uh, uh, activities, no? the open-ended working group on information technology, uh, the GGE on information and technology. We have two groups that are working on this issue, this topic, but I think that we should go ahead with other kind of, of uh, international frameworks for uh, filling the gaps that already exist. Without considering another key point, which is the application of uh, uh, the rules of international uh, humanitarian law in case of conflicts in outer space. Imagine a situation where a cyber attack provokes uh, severe damages to the population of one state disrupting uh, the communications between satellites and the earth, etc. And uh, we have disasters eh, uh, uh, following that. Imagine the reaction of one state, because uh, when you use force in outer space, uh, well, you could expect that the adversary can use the self-defense right and can exercise the self-defense right. And this is another very, very tricky point that should be considered. In this case, there could be something like a conflict in outer space and is a, 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 another debate going on about the applicability of the international humanitarian law to this kind of operations. Now, uh, taking stock uh, again of my experience within the GGE, I would like to remember that there were two groups of states in this, in this uh, regard. There were states saying that, yes, we have no doubt that international humanitarian law is applicable to this. I see Professor Cristina, which is making uh, probably <laughs> a negative impact of my words, I don't know. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, I think that 
is opposition between the group that were uh, against the reference to international uh, humanitarian law and the nation and the others that were in favor of that, in favor of that uh, was a very big opposition. But I think that we should discuss this issue because international humanitarian law is a very important field of international law that could become relevant in relation with cyber attacks and the consequences, the reversible consequences of uh, this kind of cyber operation. Uh, well, I think that I exhausted my time and I'm very sorry if you didn't hear me well. I hope that the key messages that I wanted to transmit to you were kept and thank you very much. Professor, uh, 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 we understand that you have finished your comments and to your presentation. You were very happy to listen to you, a great expert with a, a long experience uh, in, in the space uh, regarding the international uh, participation in, in the corpus, in the juridical area, the laws, and, and so it's very important for us to use uh, to. Uh, uh, hear your comments. Uh, and, and so we uh, congratulate you and uh, ask you to, uh, to appear, your permission to uh, present two questions. And is, if you agree, uh, the first question is, 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 is a little lo long question. Do, do you think that building on the existing fundamental principles to limit the potential for cyber activities to contribute to an arms race in outer space, additional peacetime comments should be agreed at the international level. It's a very complex question, and that's good to hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, the question was very long, but I think that the key point uh, in your question was, uh, uh, is there any need for additional peacetime commitments in the field of prevention of cyber attacks and malicious use of cyberspace? And as I said already, I'm a supporter of this kind of legal instruments, non-legally binding instruments, is a first step. And as this is a very, very, sensitive uh, topic, I think that to have uh, to start uh, this uh, uh, international debate on uh, part of related cyber principles, it would, very, it would be very useful to have some uh, way to commit states to follow some, some uh, rules of behavior. For instance, uh, do you agree that a state should not conduct or knowingly support ICT activity that intentionally damages or otherwise impairs the operation of a space object or related to terrestrial infrastructure? Yes, I agree that states should commit not to conduct such kind of intentional damages. Uh, do you agree that states should take appropriate measures to protect the space object and related infrastructure from cyber threats. Uh, of course, primarily through operational means. I understand the first step is to have operational technological step to avoid such kind of threats, but only also a legal commitment or a quasi-legal commitment, political commitment would be very important in my mind. Uh, and so on. So I refer again to the work of Paros, we recognized several principles and we uh, agreed on that among a certain number of states. And I, I'm sure that even others would, be, uh, would agree on such kind of prohibition of cyber interference or the potential consequences that can occur. So, this is my point. 
Thank you. Okay, Professor. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, we are very happy to to have you with us, and uh, I, I I hope that you can prepare additional questions at the end. But let 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 me finish now with my, my acknowledgments and uh, pass the the word for the next lecture. And uh, we will have the pleasure to invite Dr. Tatiana to give a, a speech to our, in our seminar. Dr. Tatiana. Thank you very much. Thank you very yours. much. Thank you very much, Brigadeira G. It's a pleasure to me to be here today. And I would like uh, to, to thank you, the Universidade da Força Aérea, UNIFA, for this important seminar. And thank you for my colleagues that are uh, speaking today. I will share my presentation. This is my tribute to Santos Dumont, the father of our aviation. So I'm Tatiana Ribeiro Viana, and uh, I have the honor to be uh, to be head a student of Professor Marquisio and the PhD in the Sapiencia and the Space Law. And now I'm a legal advisor in the Italo Latin America Institute in Rome, and also I'm, I have the pleasure to be part of the, the nucleus of uh, Space Law Studies in the SBDA with the Brigadeira G as the president. So um, I have a pleasure um, to share my studies and reflections with you, um, continues this important topic of cyber attacks. So um, uh, we will contextualization of the cyber crimes and cyber attacks. Um, and then another important topic is about the outer space regime and the state responsibility applied to cyber attacks. So you talk about the Brazilian cyber security strategy and some concludes um, reflections. So as Professor Marquise already um, said very well done, cyber, cyber crimes usually pursue private interests, no? uh, especially for economic gains. So as Professor Marquise said, the Council of Europe has a cyber crime convention that is directed for cyber crimes against individuals. States are excluded for the, for the uh, Budapest Convention. So then uh, cyber attacks usually uh, um, is an attack that lies the desire to seriously compromise a country's national security. So this, this is a kind of that maneuvers that can destroy the satellite permanently. So as NATO said in, the, in, the, in, this, in its statement on 2014, any threats that could impact a satellite's control, reliability or bandwidth availability would pose a direct challenge to national critical assets. Then, if you go um, under the outer space regime, as Professor Marquise said also, the Article 3 uh, of the Outer Space Treaty that is called the Fundamental Treaty Regulating Outer Space Activities, the Article 3 is directly uh, 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 linked to UN Charter when it says that outer space uh, and the activities in outer space uh, must should be in accordance with international law. So in the interest to maintain international peace and security. And then it's very important also article four of the outer states routine that talks about prohibits the placement of weapons of mass destruction in outer space. But there is a gap that the outer space, um, excuse me, the gap is the outer space treaty uh, don't explicitly ban weapons other than uh, mass destructions in outer space. 
So some um, nations, some states, has been interpreted that for Biden, weapon placement in space does not necessarily for by the weapons in space, such as the anti-satellite uh, weapons. So, but it's important to highlight that customary international law consider weaponization of outer space as illegal. And then another important uh, article for the outer space treaty is article six that says that the states are international responsible for national activities in outer space. And then states must to authorize and supervise national and private activities in outer space. And also the Security Council Resolution 1540 mandates it states to control actions of individuals within its borders. So another important um, convention is the Registration Convention for 1967. That is a very important mechanism to improve transparency and space situational awareness in outer space. And then here we have a gap in this transparency because some states don't inform the UN Secret General Secretary about the registry of military satellites. The United States International Register that is maintained by the, uh, the, International, the UN General Secretary has, has also obliged military satellites to be registered. There is no difference by civil, uh, commercial or military um, satellites under the Registration Convention. So another important is Article 6 of the Registration Convention that states that one state can ask assistance for another state to identify the satellite or the space uh, assets that may cause damage or deleterious nature in, uh, in its um, um, space objects. And this article is linked with the liability convention. And another important UN uh, regime is the International Telecommunication Union Radio Regulations that is responsible for allocating global radio spectrum and maintaining satellites orbital frequency. So um, there is several provision from ITU regarding, regarding protecting um, uh, satellites against harmful interference. But um, the military um, radio installations in the military satellites are exempt of the ITU coordination management. And this can limit uh, influence on military electronic warfare or cyber operations. So another important point regarding cyber attacks is about the state responsibility applied, applied to cyber attacks. Because under international law, one state can be held responsible for an act only if this wrongful act can be attributable to the states. So if the act is committed by a government department or one official by the state is easily to identify the, the responsible state. But the problem of attribution of a cyber attack is we have um, some in particular potential perpetrators. Like you have, for example, the individual hackers. Generally, they are not focusing on specific targets, but uh, they are instead seeking out vulnerability of the systems. We have also criminal organization. Usually they trend to focus around theft of data, but they are evolving to have high actions also. Then we have terrorists. They utilize internet um, to support their, their criminal organization and activities, but um, nowadays they are notable aware about the potential of cyber systems as a vulnerability to be exploited. Then we have the states. 
So stage to stage cyber attacks are now becoming a commonplace, unfortunately, in both offensive and defensive stratagems of states. So um, last but not least, we have the issue of the insider. The insider is a person who is authorized and legitimate to a state to have uh, to utilize the system. But the insider sometimes intentionally or intentionally can facilitate an attack to the network. So attribution for cyber attack to a state is a key element in building a functional legal regime to mitigate these attacks. But the key problem is that, that the lack of boundaries and the anonymity of cyber attacks. So states usually don't operate through formal state bodies and the states usually uh, would use no state actors who are less visible and more plausible deniability. So uh, to identify the responsible for a, for a cyber attack becomes a problem, factual and legal problem. So um, you can see how it's hard before under international law, considering the nature of cyber attacks distinguish among actions of terrorists, criminals, and uh, states. Now, um, I would like to, to, um, to make some um, highlight in, in the Brazilian cyber security strategy that is very um, new, is a decree for February, uh, last February, that is very interesting, interesting um, document very well structured. And um, if I um, could uh, make a suggestion in this document, uh, I would suggest that in the strategic actions in point two, point three, point five, and um, about raise the level of protection of national critical infrastructure to adding a new item in this um, national security is that uh, the protection of space assets. We have already um, uh, more less than more than 20 uh, space objects registered in the Brazilian registry, and the, so it's very important to have um, a policy to protect these space assets also. And also regarding the point 2.3.8, expand Brazil's international cooperation in cyberspace. Uh, Brazil uh, was invited by Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention to be uh, to become a member of this convention. So now um, it's important uh, to highlight that this convention excludes state acts, but it's a very important um, agreement about extraterritorial electronic evidence in crime matters. That is a very important point to in regarding uh, persecute this crime and also international cooperation between nations. Now this, um, this, um, this matter is in the National Brazilian Congress to discussion. And uh, to make some um, conclusive reflections about what we have uh, said in this presentation, I'd like to say that, uh, as you saw, the militarization of cyber and space sectors appears in part attributable to a small number of states, as Victoria um, listed in her uh, presentation. So now you can see uh, that uh, the concern is about geopolitical the dynamics. But, also, dual use technology make it more difficult to ascertain whether a country is developing a military program in addition to its civilian activities. A dual uh, use technology is the satellite, the, the same space object used by civilian uh, scopes or commercial scopes and military scopes. This increasing vulnerability of, um, of uh, national space infrastructures. 
Another uh, point of reflections is that the key issues is that the space policy is developing cut across civil military, military spectrum. For example, if you talk about the space debris, the space debris issue that is now is a very important issue that is already discussed uh, inside COPOS, in, inside the legal and scientific and technical subcommittee, it, space debris regarding uh, military and also civilian issues. Um, because um, sometimes when you talk about active debris removal, for example, technologies for active debris removal, some states considering this technology as a kind of hazard, an uh, anti-satellite space, um, and anti-satellite weapon. And also some uh, on-orbit service uh, can be uh, considered a kind of weapons in the state. So the cross, uh, cut cross civil military spectrum is a very uh, key point to start the discussion, because as you know, now we have separate um, forums for discussion regarding space. As UN couples discussing fusifus A's of space and civilian uses, commercial use, humanitarian use, and the disarmament conference discussing military use of space. I think now it's time to put this forum together to discuss the, uh, the continuity and uh, to preserve the space for a better fight. So, um, Another point, a very important point, is that you see that offense regarding cyber attacks, offense is easier and more cost effective than defense of cyber attacks. As you knew before, how it's hard to identify the authors of the cyber attacks, and also it's hard to identify is, this, is the satellite problem could be a, a cyber attack or a malfunction of the, the, the object. So it's more easy offense than defense. And now the paradox of all these uh, issues regarding cyber attacks is that space power nations are particularly vulnerable to attack from less developed states because uh, it's not so hard, it's, one, it's not so um, difficult to uh, perpetrate a cyber attack. So uh, I think it's more realist and cohesive understanding of how the multilateral treaties can evolve to address the growing challenge facing the cyber and space fields. Muito obrigada pela atenção. Dr. Tatiana, thank you very much for uh, your, your uh, words. And uh, we are gratified uh, because you approach very sensible uh, aspects of this problem. And the state responsibility is something very difficult to do. And you uh, know else, that we, in a general way, we as know, know that uh, the, the, the framework of law is always very, very slow be in front of this high speed of the crime and how is developing the use, uh, unlawful use of a technology. And this is, you approach very well to a very important problem that is an international problem. And it is, is leading many na nations to, to go at it's, it's through the uh, national law instead of international law covering this problem because space is, is strategically is related to international activities and so this is, in this way is related to international law. And so you approach very well. And this, if you allow me, we have a, a question for you. The, the question is uh, how the international law uh, and space law deal with cyber attacks in outer space and 
peace time. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Brigadeira G. Um, this is a very interesting question because now you are living in a great lines, no? Be, uh, regarding cybersecurity and cyber attacks. As uh, Professor Marquiso said, Ana Cristina, this is a very new, um, um, if you, if you um, I talk about the evolution, evolution of, of law, this is everything new in regarding law maturity. Because uh, the law, the, there is no the same time that the technology, technology go fast, but law has uh, its times uh, to reflection. So uh, we have the green line now because we have uh, no clarity how uh, to do with this kind of attacks uh, in the peace time and the uh, war times. So this is a very um, difficult period uh, when I think, um, as you said, the Outer Space Treaty that has already more than 100 uh, states part, and I think is one of the most uh, international treaty treaties regarding space activities that is um, already um, um, working. So I think um, the international community makes to be aware about this important um, challenge uh, uh, regarding basic use rules of outer space. And they need to talk together, to talk to every sectors that are benefiting of space activities need um, to, to make outer space uh, more effective, more updated, and um, updating with the, the, the new facing challenge we are living today. Thank you. Dr. Okay, Dr. Tatiana, thank you very much for your attention to your kind words and your explanation. And uh, we are very happy because you are uh, uh, a very act active member of the Brazilian Society of Aeronautical and Space Law. And so we are very gratified with your participation. And let, let us make, make I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you later. But let, let us move for a question to an, another participant. You see? With, with the, I, 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 I ask you to wait a little because I would like to ask you a question to Dr. Samson. Okay. I, okay. Okay, Brigadier. Thank you. The, the Dr. Samson, the, the question is how, how do you evaluate the risk? of terrorism actions against a nation in space. Are nations safe from terrorism in space? That's it's for, it's for you, Dr. Samson. Sure, thank you. Um, we get this question a lot. I think that's where a lot of people's minds go when they talk about cyber attacks. They think, okay, there's gonna be some sort of terrorist organization that will commandeer a satellite and you know, take out US military communications. Um, I don't think it's anything quite as exotic as that. I think probably what we would see if we were to see a non-state actor attempt to go up against another country or just a, an enemy in space, you know, it would be really easy just to go for the ground control stations. Um, that would probably be the most likely place of interference. Um, okay. They're right there, they're easier to get to other than space um, satellites up in orbit. Um, but it is a general concern about the growing interest of non-state actors in interfering with space capabilities. Um, but you have to look at, okay, what is the most, it is a potential situation, but what is the most likely situation? Um, and again, the idea would be, well, what, what would be their end goal? What would be the military utility of a non-state actor to interfere with a country's satellites? Um, they're trying to interfere with communication. You know, maybe it'd be easier just to jam the communications and you know everyone jams literally everyone jams 
um, electronic warfare radio frequency interference. So it, it is one tool that could potentially be used. It is not necessarily the most likely, but there is the potential for future conflict for it to be used. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson. You, your participation was very, very welcome. Yes, you, you were very pleased to hear about one to, to your comments. Uh, I'd, I'd like to come, come back to the Dr. Tatiana and I have a question to her. Look. Dr. Tatiana, how, may I ask you a question, Tatiana? Yes, please. Okay, how international law attributes responsibility to one nation state for cyber attack? Yes, and as I said before, thank you very much for the question. As I said before, the attribution of a cyber attack to one nation state is very hard because um, under international law, you need to connect uh, the act, the wrongful act. Yeah, first of all, the act be, uh, must be um, against international law. It seems, uh, and second, uh, the act, the wrongful act, be, should be linked with that state. So the problem is, uh, as you said, to identify the perpetrators is not easy because this kind of uh, electronic crimes or cyber crimes are very difficult, difficult to, to persecute. And then uh, another problem adding is that the state don't use it their directly um, officials. So uh, this is the difficulty is to link it, the act to one state. So attribution uh, to, um, to one state to cyber attack now is a challenge to uh, international community and to the international law. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we appreciate your, your comments. And, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, it's, it's time to close. Uh, you know, and uh, we'll have to a uh, final consideration to thank you very much for the old presentations, comments, and uh, how you enlighten the subject. And uh, we are praising very much because the Brazilians, uh, the state of art in legal procedures re regarding uh, the cyber business, the cyber, cyber area, is, is, uh, is starting right now. In the last uh, two or three years, we started with a pre preparation of uh, laws and strategies with cap capability of, deal, of dealing with this, this sub subject. It is very important. And so an, a, a meeting like this gives us a, 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 the raise of interest and it will give us opportunity to discuss about the very important matters which are not receiving the right and the uh, appropriate uh, priority inside the event, especially in government, but besides the enterprise and the, the public in general, because we are almost 200 million of uh, users of, of uh, uh, technology, electronic technology, which are subject of sens sensible to cyber attacks. We have 10 million enterprises in Brazil and all of them need to be clarified and motivated related to the problems of the defense and the pre uh, preparation against uh, uh, cyber attacks. This is extremely important in this, in this country at this moment. And this uh, uh, initiative, this uh, capacity of the uh, uh, university to develop this subject is extremely important, both in the side of defense, he has dual face 
the military and the civilian one. And so it's very difficult to understand for the public in general, even to some experts in other subjects about the importance of this matter in order to give us the appropriate the mentality and, and the, uh, 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 preparation to face what we consider that a risk. We have always a subject to threatens and the risk which will, would affect our life. And so I congratulate all of you, congratulate all of you participating or uh, attending this, the, the, this meeting and consider that this was very, very useful. And I hope that you are getting fruitful consequence of this time we spent in a very sensible and very important in modern life and use of technology relating all to the space and which are moving our lives in the time of being. Thank you very much for all. The Brazilian Air Force University and Getulio Vargas Foundation thanks the presence of all the lecturers and the mediator, inviting the audience for our next webinar on October 27, 2020 at 10 a.m. Good afternoon. <laughs>